Well, good morning. I'm glad you're here this morning. I hope you've enjoyed worshiping the Lord. Uh, I want to ask you a question this morning. Who in your life do you really love? I mean, who do you love? If, if for just a minute, take, take 10 seconds, if you would, make a list in your mind of maybe the top three, top five people that you really love in your life. Take 10 seconds, think of who, who would that be? Did any of you put your spouse on the list? If you did, if they're sitting next to you, you could raise your hand, right? You know, I did, right? Okay. Did any of you put your girlfriend or your boyfriend, and if they're next to you, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to yet, you know, if you're not there. Uh, did any of you put your parents on the list, your mom or your dad, okay? All right. Did, did anybody put maybe uh, uh, your children on the list? You know, okay, all right. Anybody put a best friend on the list? Okay, all right. Yeah, probably most of us would include ourselves in some of those categories. We'd say, man, I, I love those, that group of people. But did any of you include your former boss? Oh, there's one. All right, very good. Praise the Lord. How about your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend? Uh, okay, how, how about the political candidate that you're not going to vote for? Anybody put that person? You know, those people have a tendency to make another list in our life, don't they? It's no secret that some people are harder for us to love. The person with the personality that just annoys you. Or, or someone in your friend group who deeply wounded you. Or maybe... Somebody who took advantage of you. you. You know what I found? Sometimes people are really hard to love. Sometimes even those who make our list are hard to love. Maybe we have a spouse who, who uh, does something that feels like betrayal or somebody in our family disappoints us or a friend ignores us. It can be hard to love sometimes. Really hard to love sometimes. Uh, truthfully, it's in those moments where it's hard to love when you know if you really got it or not. Because real love is tested in hard times. And real love is practiced on even hard to love people. Sometimes it is difficult to love. But this is how you know if you have God's unconditional agape love in your heart. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, anybody can pull off loving somebody like them. Anybody can love those who love them. But there's no reward in that. Pagans do this. Tax collectors do this. Sinners do this. Everybody does this. But Christian love is different. Christian love loves even those who are hard to love. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 12. If this is your first time here, what we are doing at our church is we're spending the year of 2023 walking verse by verse through the book of Romans. We're in chapter 12, and up to this per point, Paul has laid out what the gospel of God is, what the good news of God is, what we share every week, and that is that there's a God in heaven who loves you deeply. And even though you are uh, filled with sin, uh, Jesus came to show you his love, and, and he didn't just come to show you how to live, and that he did well, but that's not why he came. He came to be a sacrifice for you, to die on your behalf so that you could be forgiven and so that you could have a right relationship with God. And what God shows us in Romans and what God shows us through his word, through the Apostle Paul, is that all we have to do is receive what Jesus did for us on the cross. We don't have to work for it. We don't have to jump through religious hoops. We don't have to be moral enough for God to love us. We have to take our faith and we have to transfer our faith from ourselves to God. I often say that we have to transfer our trust and no longer trust ourselves to make God happy, but we trust what Jesus did for us to make us right with God. Then we get to chapter 12, and he talks about how we 
how we are to live if we are believers. He says, in view of God's mercy, because of what he did and because of everything I just told you about in verses 1 through 11, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And he says we do that by offering our bodies to God and say, God, here's my body. I want to live holy for you. And we do this by renewing our mind. And saying, God, I want you to fix my broken ways of thinking. The broken ways that I think about people. The broken ways I think about myself. I want to believe and think according to your gospel. And then he tells us, if you're going to give your body as a living sacrifice, you've got to be a part of God's community. Because God has designed it where you are to be members of his local body. Individuals, but members of one another. And you serve one another. And you love one another. And he lays that out in verses 6 through 8. And then last week, we talked about how if you're a part of the local body, you're supposed to love each other. And we started in verse 19 looking at 16 participles where he said, this is what it looks like if you are a believer. This is what it looks like if you're really loving the way that God intends for you to love. Now, last week, we looked at a bunch of participles that kind of talked about how you love people who are in your church. And I hope that maybe somebody in your church made your list that you love one another, uh, But then we get to verse 14, and he starts talking about how you love people who would never make your list. How do you love those who are hard to love? He starts out in verse 14 and says, bless those who persecute you. Now, to understand this passage, you got to understand when Paul wrote this, there's a couple of things about their context that are important to remember. First, all the church was poor. History tells us that the majority of the church, almost everyone in the church who joined early was from the poor class. And in that day, the Romans didn't feel any uh, guilt about oppressing poor people. You know, they would, they would force labor. They would excise or, or uh, make them pay uh, tons of taxes. They would, they would oppress them at every, at every turn. And this is who the Christians were. They were discriminated against regularly, and nobody was advocating for them. Then he said, another thing that you need to remember is persecution in Rome was picking up as well. When Romans was written, it was the early stages of Nero's reign. If you remember, almost every emperor had somebody they picked on. Claudius, right before Nero, expelled the Jews and kicked them out of Jerusalem. But now Nero has welcomed the Jews back in, but he turns his attention toward the Christians. And at first, he doesn't do anything that's that out of line. But over time, persecution ramped up. And that persecution would be so intense by the end of Paul's life that he would be beheaded. And many of the first readers of the book of Romans were killed in the Colosseum. And to them, he says, when somebody persecutes you, I want you to, I want you to bless them. You see, Christians should love people who mistreat them. The honest truth is we don't face much physical persecution in the United States. But there are those who don't treat us correctly. There are those who don't show respect. There are those who make fun of. There are those who constantly stand opposed to us. And how do we respond? I was in Ohio this week preaching at the Ohio Baptist Convention. I was working with a group of about 120 preachers and was talking to them about kind of revitalization and how to work in a church and and just sharing hopefully some wisdom that I've gained through 35 years of ministry. And at one of the breaks, a guy came up to me and told me or asked me the question. He said, what do you do when you get an anonymous letter? Now, when somebody asks you a question, that usually means something's going on in their life. And I said, hey, man, is somebody doing that? And he kind of poured his heart out and he started talking about what was going on. And I listened to him and I counseled him. And when he was talking to me, I remembered the story of a man by the name of uh, uh, David Kennedy, who was a pastor who shared how every week he got an anonymous letter. I mean, and this anonymous letter was brutal. They would talk about how bad his preaching was, and they would talk about how, how irrelevant he was and how unfaithful to the text he was, and just over and over and over, they just brutalized him. And they signed it every week from the thorn. One week she told him, In the letter, I am signing this as the thorn because Paul had a thorn in his flesh uh, to, to help him to grow. And I am your thorn. 
And he said, man, I wish I could find out her name. Because if I could find out her name, I would start writing anonymous letters to her, and I would sign it the hedge trimmer. You know, <laughs> there is, that's probably not the best approach. <laughs> but the reality is you're going to have people in your life who make you miserable. And the Bible says the response of the Christian is always to seek the good of the person in front of us. No matter how they treat us, we're to pray for them. We're to bless them. We're to bless them and not curse. Uh, you ever been driving down Nicholasville Road and somebody cuts you off in traffic and then they look at you like it's your fault? You ever had that happen? They lay on the horn and you can tell they're cursing at you and, and waving their arms and they drive by you and they tell you how great they think you are. You know, it is not our natural reaction to say, well, God bless you, brother. I mean, that's not normal. We understand that. And yet Jesus called us when somebody attacks us and persecutes us and, 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 and it comes at us. He said to bless and not to curse, even those who persecute us. You know who else is hard to love? People who are going through different situations in life. Listen to what he says in verse 15. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. You know, in my life, I've found that it's really easy to respond to somebody well if they're going through the same thing I'm going through. It is six days until Kentucky football season, right? I, I think I've mentioned this two weeks in a row. I'm not fixated on it, but it's six days. I know that when we're pummeling Ball State next week, there's going to be opportunities to high-five people around me as I hopefully get to watch the game. And if they're wearing blue, it's going to be so easy to do. It's easy to celebrate somebody in your workplace getting a bonus if you just got a raise. That's easy. It's also easy when you're hurting to empathize with people who are hurting. You know, this is why support groups are so attractive. People feel the similar pain, and so they like to sit with people who understand their pain, whether it's substance abuse or whether it's, or whether it's grief. That we, it's easy to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice if it matches your situation. But what if others are weeping and you are in an, in an upward trajectory and life is grand? Can you weep with somebody who's not where you're at? If somebody's hurting, love doesn't demand that my mood has to prevail. I, I don't keep people at arm's length because I'm having a great day and they're a Debbie Downer and I don't want to deal with them. Love mourns with them. We come alongside others and we love. We can't be so self-consumed as believers that we don't recognize what others are facing. And you know what else I've found? Rejoicing with someone who is succeeding is incredibly tough when you're not. Can you celebrate somebody else's victory? Can you celebrate somebody else losing 25 pounds if you found it? You know? Can you celebrate someone getting a promotion at work if you got passed over? Real love can. Agape love can. Agape love is evidenced when we rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And that's hard. You know, another hard time is when you're dealing with people who are different than you. That's, it's just hard. He says in the very next phrase, live in harmony with one another. We have a hard time understanding people who are different from us. A really hard time. If you're a conservative spender... Oh my goodness, you might not understand somebody who has this high tolerance for risk. If you're an extrovert, you know, you may not understand an introvert. I know for me, it's just easy for me to, to love people who are like me. If you like numbers and you enjoy competition and you like problem solving, man, we can talk all day and the bond of, of brotherhood is created quickly. But I don't always get artistic minds. And I don't always get super organized people. And I never get Tennessee fans. I don't, I mean, how? I mean, you know, but, and what happens is our differences can create a love challenge. So what we do is we dismiss people we don't understand, but that's not okay. 
God has designed our differences to complement each other, not live in conflict with each other. We're to live in harmony. Harmony is not sameness. Harmony is, is, is unity in spite of differences. In a song, today when our worship team led, they were harmonizing together. Somebody sings a melody line, somebody sings a third above that, and I think that's the tenor line, and a third above that is the alto line, and if I'm wrong, don't correct me, I think I'm right, okay? But, uh, that, that, and when they sing them together, it meshes, and it sounds good, even though they're different notes. I'll never forget when I was pastor at Pellville. Uh, Pellville was a rural town, it's in Davis County. Hancock, Hancock County, right on the Davis County line, literally, uh, anyhow, it's a long story. Uh, but Pellville is like rural, like 15 miles to a gas station rural, okay? It's a, a country, country town. And uh, there were people who moved there because they wanted to be away from town. We had a couple who moved into our church, and they weren't Amish, but they kind of wanted to live like it. Have you ever met someone who wants to live a simple life? They just kind of retreat. This couple was an awesome Christian couple, and I loved when they would have us over on Sunday afternoons. We would go over, and they would fix this humongous spread, and it was fantastic, and we would eat. And about 2 o'clock, he would pull out his guitar, and we would start to sing. And we were singing together, their children, uh, 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 my family. And as we were sitting there singing, you know, I started wanting to do harmony. Because I like to sing harmony. I don't know why. I just like to try. And I did. I tried to sing harmony. And when we got done, I think it was Amazing Grace. When we got done with the song, the guy said, hey, on this next one, why don't you sing melody? I think you've got a melody voice. <laughs> you know what that means? You can't sing. <laughs> That's what that means. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you sing the same note, but you got to sing in the right key. And the right key for the Christian is kindness and selflessness. It's humility. It is generosity. It's patience. It's love. And when people are different from us, sometimes it's hard for us to give that because they're not like us, but we're called to live in harmony and not be proud. Pride is the enemy of the harmonious life. And then he says, associate with the humble. There's various translations of this. Some translations say, don't uh, uh, be proud, but do humble things. I think that's wrong. I think in context, a better translation is probably what your Bible says. Don't be proud, but associate with the humble people. I, I believe he's talking about people who are who, who are. Who, who are different than us. And the pursuit of harmony in the church should make the church a place where class distinctions are broken down and the ethnic barriers are non-existent and, non -existent, and idiosyncrasies are ignored or overlooked. And this is easier said than done because human tendency is to associate with people who seemingly add value. Because that's who you hang around, right? The people who can add value to your life, who can help you build a resume, people who can add to your knowledge, people who are pleasant and bring you up. and I mean, that's human tendency. Uh, but the Christian ethic is to see value in all, even those who can't do anything for us, who don't give us any personal advantage. Real love cares for the homeless. Real love cares for the user. Real love cares for the limited and the slow and the unattractive, and the irritating. I know it's hard, but I hope you know that every person you meet is intensely loved by God. And we should know that we are just as lowly as anyone else. But you know what our problem is? Most of us are really wise in our own estimation. We think we're the standard of normal, or the standard of proficiency. We're the baseline of giftedness. And in those moments, we need to remind ourselves when our mind goes there that we were at a place in our life where somebody had to condescend to us, every one of us. 
Every one of us were so broken and flawed that if we were going to be right with God, it took Jesus condescending to us. The one who was everything became nothing. And who, he took on the form of a man, even though he was the God of the universe. The one who knows the extent of the universe chose to put himself in a very finite place at a finite time. And he came here, made himself nothing, not for no reason, but for every reason, so that he could pay the price for you, so that you could live forever with him. And so the next time you start to feel haughty, remind yourself of the cross. You were the one that needed someone to reach down to you. Don't be proud. And then he turns the difficulty up like a thousand percent. And he says, real love trusts God and seeks peace and forgives even when you're wronged. Even when evil has been done to you. Notice what he says in verse 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. This is a hard verse on like lots of levels. And when I read this this week, it just was like an anvil on my soul. Because when I read this, I recognize that evil might come to me. Some people get up and preach, if you have God on your side, he's a shield and defender and nothing will ever come against you. Have you read the Bible? I mean, Paul, at every turn, is oppressed and afflicted and beaten. Have you read about the, the, the disciples who were, who, who, were, who were sawn in two and who were uh, 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 oppressed and harmed because of their faith? Have you read history about those who burned, were burned at the stake? Have you lived life where you walked outside and you recognized that evil happens to you? Man, when I read this, oh, I don't like to hear that because evil might come my way. But you know what's even heavier than the thought of evil coming my way? I might want and am capable of doing evil. Do you see that in this verse? Do not repay evil for evil, which means you have the capacity to do it. You wouldn't get this warning if you didn't. And then the third thing that really bothers me is deep down there's a want to. I want to get even. I want to repay. We want to form allies. We want to tell the secret if somebody told one of ours. We, we, we want to smear somebody else if they're trying to harm us or have embarrassed us. The desire to get even is real. But if you follow through on that desire, you're not only not loving, but you're committing evil. One of Jesus' most recognized teachings is this in Matthew chapter 5. He says, if anyone slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other cheek. That's a hard verse, isn't it? You know, most of us want to know what this means. Like, okay, well, what if you turn the right cheek? I know I'm not supposed to get even with people, and they slap me, and I turn the other cheek, and then they slap me again. What do I do? I think every Christian has had that question. I went to my pastor when I was being discipled. His name is Scott Ford. I love Scott. He's gone to be with Jesus. Uh, look forward to catching up with him one day. Uh, but uh, I went to him and I asked him, I said, Scott, I don't understand this. What am I supposed to do? Just stand down every time somebody abuses me? Stand down every time somebody hits me? What am I supposed to do? And uh, Scott said, Nick, I tell you what you do. If you turn the other cheek and somebody hits you again, you know, you, you turn the cheek and then they slap the other cheek. Here's what you do. You listen? I said, yeah. He said, beat the snot out of them. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was not what Jesus is intending by this. <laughs> Scott told me many, many good things. That wasn't one of them. Uh, I, I, I think partially that question comes from people misunderstanding this verse. A person hitting you on the cheeks, not trying to kill you. Now, if any of you go to self-defense classes, they don't say, I tell you what, if you get in one of those uh, fight or die situations, go for their cheek. They never tell you that, ever. That's, you know, what, what, you, what you need to understand here is this was an insult. Remember in those old European movies where somebody would take their glove off slowly and they would take that glove and they would walk up to somebody and they would smack them on the cheek? Well, that wasn't a, a, an abusive situation to where they were going to, like, die. It was an offensive situation where they're saying, I hate you, and I want this relationship to end. And what Jesus is saying is when somebody acts in a relationship that you have like they want it to end, 
turn the other cheek and say, I, I'm not willing to let your action keep us from being able to have a loving relationship. I, 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 I'm, going to, I, I'm going to love you in spite of the wrong that you've done to me. And starting in verse 18, he gives practical advice how to pull that off. Because to be honest with you, this is, this is where the rubber hits the road as a Christian. And most of us have no idea how to pull this off. How do you pull this off to forgive when somebody's wronged you? Listen to what he says. Verse 17. Don't repay anyone evil for evil, but give careful thought. Can you hear something ringing in your ears that you've heard all your life? Think before you act or speak. Think before you respond. The impulsive hit back response is the way of our world, but it's not the way of Christ. It doesn't fix an already broken relationship. Most of that time it completely obliterates it. And then he says, do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. Remember your witness. People are watching you. Do you remember back in school? You know, I'm showing my age here. When the teacher would turn around and write on a chalkboard. For those of y'all who don't know what a chalkboard is, it's that green thing in old basements. You know, uh, and the teacher would run, turn around and, and then one of your friends would do something to you. Maybe they would like take a pencil and hit you on the leg or they would thump you in the head. And you would turn around and respond. Did you ever notice that the teacher always turned around while you were responding? That's the way it seems to work. People are watching Christians. When we punch back, we don't fix anything, and we run the risk of ruining our testimony. And you know the world has high expectations for us, right? They expect us to give food to the needy. People who don't believe in God believe it's the Christian's role to give food to the needy. They believe it's our responsibility to help the oppressed. People believe it's our responsibility to, to solve problems in at-risk communities. Community leaders you don't, that, who, who never cater to the church or our ideals or our, our thoughts will be the first to call us and say, we need help in this community. Can you help? Because they have high expectations of us. And they expect us to do everything we do with kindness and to never raise our voice. Whether we want it or not, the world is watching. And if we respond incorrectly, we're hurting kingdom work. Try to do what is honorable before them. Another thing to do is attempt to de-escalate. Christians are to be peacemakers. We're to live at peace with everyone. Not just those on our A-list, but those on any list. And he says here, that you aren't even in control of the outcomes. I mean, you can't fix everything. But you are in control of you. And you must do your part as much as you possibly can. Peace might not come. The relationship might not be salvaged. In fact, there's a good chance that if somebody's got to the point where they'll slap you on the cheek... Uh, metaphorically, they're, they're done. It might not work out. But you've done everything you can do, and you've honored God. And God says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. I know when we don't get even, it feels like we're letting people off the hook. Right? Somebody abuses you or somebody does something evil to you or somebody says something harsh to you. I know it feels like we're letting them off the hook. But what Paul tells us next is like of utmost importance. It's not your job to deal with them. You have to trust God's justice. Listen, he, he, he says, don't avenge yourselves. Don't take matters into your own hands, not against your spouse who was insensitive and uncaring after a hard day, not against your sister who, who borrowed your favorite pair of jeans without asking and got a, a, a 15th rip in them, not against the guy at work who spread untrue gossip about you, not against a parent who disrespected you, not against a child who has made you, you, you live in this unfair existence, not even against the person who's committed a crime against you. Why? Because God says vengeance is mine. I own this. 
I have established that I am the one in control of vengeance. Judgment is God's job, and he'll do it. He is on his throne, even though all is not right in our world. And you know all is not right in our world. He's on his throne. And he's on his throne if all's not all right in your world. He'll avenge the wicked. And when you take matters into your own hand, you usurp God's authority and you're saying, I know better. And I'm here to tell you, you don't. You absolutely don't know better than God. We need to get out of the way and leave room for God's wrath. Not one sin will go unpunished. Every sin ever committed will either be paid for in hell or it will be paid for by Jesus on the cross. It will happen. He will bring justice, so trust the Lord. And then he tells us something that feels almost impossible and only the power of the Holy Spirit can enable us to do this. We should actively show kindness to the offenders. He says, if your enemy is hungry, give them something to eat. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. This is the ultimate act of love to return kindness for evil. And then he says something uh, that people have misinterpreted. He says, in doing so, you're going to heap coals on their head. Now, some people have said, here's what you need to do. You need to be really nice to somebody you don't like because that'll really make them hot under the collar. I promise you Paul is not advocating for that. He's just spent like 14 verses telling you, here's how you love people, here's how you love people. Trust God, trust God. He's now all of a sudden not playing some type of spiritual jiu-jitsu and saying, okay, you can really make it bad on them. That's not what he's doing at all. The best guess I have is in their day, they didn't have matches. And so keeping a fire wasn't easy. And so they would keep coals, hot coals. And if a person neglected their fire, neglected their coals, they would go out and you'd have to go to a neighbor and you'd borrow coals. Somebody might be stingy and give you nothing. Somebody might do the least they could do and give you one. But that coal could go out in the process of trying to start a fire. Heaping coals on them was giving them above and beyond what they needed. It would kind of be like us saying metaphorically, man, that person would give you the shirt off of his back. He says, if you do this, you're showing kindness on top of kindness. This gesture's meant to end hostility, not to prolong it. Now, here's the real hard thing as we wrap up this morning. When somebody does something to you, That's hard, emotionally, maybe physically. But the harder part is they also do something inside of you. Right? Because when somebody has wronged you, this war starts internally and the devil immediately starts to tell you about your rights and you feel this inner frustration that injustice has, ha- has won and he, Satan begins to whisper that you need to get revenge and bitterness begins to set in and he promises you if you get even, you'll feel better and then you try and you don't. There's a war inside. What Paul says to summarize this section, you want to win that war? Do good. Don't be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. There's a lady in our, uh, who's connected to our church who shares her testimony often. I ask her permission to share it with you today. She was married to a person who was good looking, in ministry, successful, on a trajectory to do amazing things in the world's eyes. They had two kids together, a good income, stable life. Things were good. And this was in about the 1980s, late 1980s, early 90s. She found that he had been making, producing pornography with multiple women in the community. She confronted him. He repented. She forgave. The pattern continued. Multiple offers of 
trying to stay with for the good of the family and work through and love. But after repeated sin, she found herself in an unwanted divorce and unwanted poverty. She's raising her kids alone, scraping to make it, dealing with personal shame and pain. What did I not do that didn't make our marriage work? And somewhere in it, she heard the Holy Spirit whisper that she needed to forgive. She allowed her kids to see her, their dad periodically. Over time, she even started inviting him to their family gatherings because, because of his decisions. He had like isolated himself from everybody in his life. He got cancer. And he didn't have anybody who would care for him. Because of the choices he made, he found himself alone dealing with something that he couldn't deal with. This lady stepped in and she helped give him rides to the hospital. She served him meals when he couldn't cook. Her and her kids cleaned his house. That's conquering evil with good. I asked her when I, if I could tell this today and she said, sure, her testimonies helped hundreds of women. But she told me, she said, Nick, make sure you tell them I didn't get there overnight. She got there because she realized how much God had forgiven her. That's why for the last few weeks I've been begging you, you want to live a holy life? Keep thinking about the cross. You want to overcome that pornography addiction? Look why, what Jesus paid because of your pornography addiction. You, you want to overcome that bitterness that's in your soul towards someone? Think about what Jesus did for you when God had every right to be bitter with all of us. You, you want to overcome some of those petty differences? Think of how much Jesus endured on your behalf. In view of God's mercy, brothers and sisters, present your bodies as living sacrifices. Serve the king, love your friends, and even love your enemies. And I want to tell you, there's no more powerful witness in the church than people who loved when they've been wrong. You want to know this is off script, but you want to know why I think the church is failing in America? I think we got to the point where we started attacking our enemies instead of loving our enemies. You see, it's our love for people who are different than us that makes us stand out. What propels the gospel forward is when people look at us and they say, I don't understand what makes them tick, but something about them just oozes love, and I want to know what it is. And then we get to move in, and we get to tell, I love you because God first loved me. That's the type of people we need to be. That's the type of people who've experienced the gospel. I pray that's the type of people we are. Here's what I want you to take home with you today. Number one, this is just a fact. You're going to encounter people who are difficult to love. I might be one of those people sometime. You might be for me. There might be people who live in that category. But you're going to encounter them. Number two, what they are doing to you does not dictate your response. You are to love. And we can trust God to bring justice and he'll bring it in his time. Now you might be here today and you're in a situation where somebody's physically harming you or abusing you. Do not hear this message as me saying you need to stay in that situation. 
Next week, we're going to talk about Romans 13, where God has established government to deal with injustice in the land. If someone is abusing you or harming you, I encourage you to tell an official, to tell a pastor, to tell someone so that their injustice can be dealt with by God's agent. But you're not it. As an individual, you're to respond with love. And then the fourth thing I would tell you is you're only going to respond like this if you focus on Christ. You're just not going to white knuckle your way to this. You've got to focus on what Jesus did for you. And if you do that, I believe you will start to see the love of Jesus not only flow to you, but flow out of you. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. And I thank you for the opportunity to share it today. I ask God that you would use it for your glory. Lord, forgive us when we don't love well. Thank you for the mercy of Jesus that came because we can't love well without him. And Lord, I thank you that you love us in spite of our frailty and our weakness and our natural responses. Lord, I pray that you would do a great work in us so that we could bring honor to you, great God, while we live on this earth.